Welcome to the Sanctuary of Liberty Baptist Church of Chicago. We are so excited that you tuned in for Friday Night Word. Over the past several years, we've been blessed by you, your comments, your encouragement for our media ministry. You may feel that we have helped you, but we want you to know you've been a blessing to us. And because of that, the Lord put in our spirit to do Friday night word. This is an opportunity as you come to the close of your week to hear a word from God that carries you through the weekend and into the next week. We know that weekends can be hectic and sometimes we may forget to tune in on Sunday. And so this is yet another opportunity for God to speak to you on what he has specifically for you. We pray that Friday night word is a blessing to you. I have been praying for you. I may not know some of you all's names. I may never see your face. But I want you to know I have been praying that this moment bless you, liberate, and transform your life. We are excited to have you as part of the family of Liberty Baptist Church of Chicago. And for those of you that often hear it, and those of you that may be hearing this for the first time, we never start a worship service here at Liberty Baptist Church without this affirmation. Something that is great for Sunday and only for Sunday. But we declare today that this word is good for Friday. And so without any further ado, I declare friends and family, it's church time. It's church time. Oh, yes, it's church time. Welcome to Friday Night Word. Be blessed. Go ahead, go ahead, y'all. Go ahead. Come on. Come on. Come on. He's great. Some on the tight right now. He's mighty. He's mighty. 
He's mighty. You ought to be dancing in your kitchen right now because he's mighty. You ought to be lifting your hands in your bathroom because he's mighty. You ought to be dancing a jig in your front room because he's mighty. You ought to be running around your block with your iPad in your hand because he's mighty. your dance song. You ought not need to be in church to get your shout on. You ought not need me to get your praise on. He's worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the saints. He's worthy. He's worthy. Oh yes, he's worthy. And when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Can I get four people on the line right now to just say he's worthy to be praised? another day's journey and we're glad about it could have been dead sleeping in our grave but we're glad about it we thank God as always for our musicians for Brother Cocker Hammond for the Liberators Ensemble see all that we've been doing for a year all we've been doing for a year is getting ready getting this seat warm for you um, we, I don't, I don't, when we come back in here, you ought to have a shout in your voice. You ought to have a pep in your step. See, we've been warming our shout up for you, and I declare we ain't going to never shout in here. We're going to always shout in here. For he's worthy to be praised. After all that we've been through, we could have been gone, but God has blessed us to be here yet another day. God be praised. God be praised. I feel a little better now. I got a feeling that everything's going to be all right. As is our custom, won't you all stand? Won't everybody stand for the reading of God's holy word? We're going to do something just a bit different from our typical protocol uh, today. We're going to ask that you put your fingers on several books of the Bible. Put your finger on Mark. Put your finger on John. And put your finger on Acts. Put your finger on Mark. Put your finger on John. And put your finger on Acts. And as is our custom, won't you hold your Bibles high? And repeat after me. This is the word of God. It has liberated and transforming power. I will praise God for this preaching moment. And I declare that after this moment, that I shall never, ever be the same. God be praised. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for another day. We thank you, God, for teaching us to praise you anyhow. We thank you, God. You've given us a praise through our sickness. You've given us a praise through our doubt. You've been giving us a praise through our absence from one another and for that God we thank you now Lord touch the words of my mouth that they not be of my own understanding but God may they fall fresh from you someone may be liberated and transformed by the renewing of their mind this indeed is our prayer 
In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say, Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Just keep your fingers on those books of the Bible. Mark, John, and Acts. Now, if you want it in the order that is coming, you want to put, go to John first, Mark, and then Acts. All right? This won't be difficult verses for you today. John, Mark, and then Acts for today. I want to talk today for a few moments from the subject, the three assurances of the gospel. The three assurances of the gospel. Songwriter Jenny Wilson wrote these words. Time is filled with swift transition. Naught on earth unmoved can stand. Wilson, in this open phrase of the gospel hymn, hold to God's unchanging hand, is sharing with us the gravity of life and its ability to change in a moment's notice. Life's uncertainty that we must face with faith daily. Swift transition. Life that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, can turn on its axis from joy to sorrow. And so Jenny Wilson wants to remind us that Time is indeed filled with swift transition. Naught on earth unmoved can stand. Faith that is not easily transitioned or faces transition is unmovable faith. Faith that is not swung by the uncertainty of time is unmovable faith. And we must live lives that face this uncertain time of unmovable faith with strength and fortitude. This faith, unmovable, unshakable faith, counters the uncertainty of swift transition. And despite swift transition, we as God's people are planted like a tree by the rivers of waters. And we dare to say in the midst of the complexity of life's sweet transition that we shall not be moved. I believe that another songwriter, when echoing the importance of faith against life's sweet transition, uses these words, faith, that can conquer anything. We need a faith in moments of swift transition that can conquer anything. Faith that will stand the tide of change. Faith that will stand the tide of pandemic. Faith, God's faith, that can conquer absolutely, positively anything. Sometimes in life, the only thing that you have is faith. Uh, uh, sometimes there are curveballs that will come your way. And you might not have any money, but God bless the fact that you've got faith. Faith, although our divine countermeasure to swift transition, that life, no matter how much faith that we have, will still test us. Faith, although it is the countermeasure to swift transition, that no matter how faithful or how much faith we have, you better have and know this, that you will be tested in life's journey. I would that you not think that you're so holy that you can't be tested. 
I, I, I would that you don't think that you come down to the church house so much that you can't be tested. I don't care who your grandmother is. I don't care who your grandfather is. I don't care how long you've been on the membership roll. If you keep on living long enough, you will be tested. The ups and the downs of life. The winds and the waves. The sunsets and the midnight hours are enough to have you question your destiny. Things that hit you like a boulder, winds that shake your steady step, and things that in the midnight hour would dare to have you lose your mind. I declare to tell you today that I've been preaching since I've been 16 years old, but there have been times where winds have come my way where I thought about putting the Bible down. And I thought about giving up on the call that God had given me, but if it hadn't been for the grace of God. So I'm here to tell you with red tie on and Bible in my hand that life will take you through some stuff that'll make you want to put your destiny down. And if you are not careful, the questioning of your destiny, the questioning of your destiny can lead to disgust, disenchantment, depression, and worse, misdirection that keeps you from living a life pleasing to God. Swift transition, naught on earth unmoved can stand. If you are not careful, can lead to disenchantment, depression, disgust, misdirection, and keep you from the promise of God. Beloved, what keeps you disgusted all day long? What's keeping you depressed all day long? What is keeping you disenchanted all day long? Ain't nothing good happening? Then I dare for you to investigate the reservoir of your soul and find joy, faith, unmovable faith that can conquer anything. So you can grab a life that's pleasing to God and God alone. To pull us out of our precarious predicaments of winds and waves. To pull us out of our precarious predicament of sunsets and midnight hours to pull us out of our precarious predicament of ups and downs, good days and bad days. We ought to consider God's body of work. We ought to consider what God has done. As I've lived life, I've learned a danger in life. But when storm clouds come, we seem to only focus on the storm clouds. And when I have managed people in the secular world and even in the church world, it's dangerous when we only measure something by the bad times. When we only measure something by the downs. When we only measure something by anger and disenchantment. And if we're going to get out of the precarious predicament of ups and downs and winds and waves. I submit to you today, brothers and sisters, you ought to consider God's total body of work. Because it is in the body of work that we see our valleys are just a moment in time. Our struggles won't last 
always. Time is full of swift transition and time is full of moments where the divine body of work of God can allow you to shout and dance in the midst of your storm. See, when you consider God's body of work, you're able to understand the incontrovertible fact that you may be down right now, but I dare you to rewind the tape of your life and you can see when you were down how he brought you out. See, that's considering God's body of work. You won't be depressed when you go through your valley because remember when you didn't have nothing? Remember when you didn't know what you were going to eat? Remember when you didn't get your degree? Remember how God pulled you up, brought you out, picked you up, and turned you around? That's consideration of God's body of work. So whenever swift transition comes, not on earth a move can stand that seems like it wants to bring you down. I dare you consider what he's done for you. I, I dare that you consider and think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he done for you. And in the midst of your sickness, in the midst of your pain, your soul will cry out, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Two times, too many times in life, because our mortal state, because of our sinful state, always wants to focus on the negative. We have short memories, we have amnesia, and we forget about the good things that God has done for you. And everybody listening today, you ought to shout hallelujah because you are the byproduct of God's divine body of work. Can I get a witness today? I may not have what I want right now, but I got more than I used to. I may be going through some depressing times, but that thing that wanted to kill me a few years ago, it didn't get me. I'm still here giving God some praise. Oh, I may, I may have lost some friends along the way, but, but I thank God because I'm reminded that he kept me when nobody was with me. He kept me when I couldn't keep myself. And so, if I, even when I want to be depressed, I find a Holy Ghost shout that rises up in me to give God some praise. I could lay, I could come every Sunday and be depressed because I'm looking at a thousand empty seats. I could come and be depressed because the choir ain't here no more. I could come and be depressed because I don't have the full complement of the deacon board, but I can't help but shout because I remember that when there was a time when there was no seats to be filled. I remember there was a time when I was worrying about how the church bill was going to get paid. But even in pandemic, the Lord has been good. So I dare not have a pity party. Saints, you got to stop that pity party that's in your soul. When you consider how good God has been, somebody saying, preacher, that's easy for you because it looks like things are going fine for you. Can I share something with you? Baby, did he wake you up this morning? Uh, baby, did just a second ago your heart beat? Baby, just a second ago, did you have running water to drink water? Baby, just a second ago, do you know your name? Are you clothed and in your right mind? Then anybody that's under that description today ought to consider God's divine body of work. So when we consider the divine body of work of God, then we get not so depressed with our valleys. Not that you don't have them, you get not so depressed when swift transition comes upon you. Because when you consider the totality of God, then and therein lies your praise. I apologize. I just got happy thinking about the goodness of the Lord. Beloved, there is no greater evidence of God's body of work than the Bible itself. The Bible, which is the foundation of our personal relationship with God is divine evidence illustrated of God's body of work. In the body of work of God known as the Bible, we find three assurances of God expressed 
and what we affectionately call the gospel. In the Bible, we find three assurances of God's body of work known in what we call the gospel. Can I take y'all to Sunday school for a minute? Somebody might be asking, I've heard the gospel. And I've heard the gospel is the good news. But it's more than good news. It's good news that embodies three assurances that occur in three phases of the life of Christ. The gospel exemplifies the holy purpose of God's body of work. It is known as the good news. It is the reason why we sing. See, if there is no gospel, there is no first Sunday joy. If there is no gospel, there is no divine arch on 49th and King Drive. But the gospel embodies these three things. Birth, death, and resurrection. Um, I, I know there's 66 books of the Bible. I know there's sermons that can be told, many of which I have done. But at the end of the day, the divine purpose of God, the three assurances of God come to us through three ways, the birth, the death, and the resurrection. If I could give you a cliff note version, I would give you one sheet of paper that says this, the Bible. And if I did the Bible, I would put in bold print these three phrases, birth, death, and resurrection. If there is no birth, death, and resurrection, it, it doesn't matter that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. It doesn't matter. If there is no birth, death, and resurrection, it doesn't, it doesn't matter the genius of David as he took a slingshot and hit Goliath in the forehead and cut his head off. If there is no birth, death, and resurrection, Isaiah's dream of seeing the Lord high on the throne becomes irrelevant. If there is no birth, death, and resurrection. Ezekiel seeing a wheel in the middle of the wheel becomes irrelevant. If there is no birth, death, and resurrection, Moses stepping out a rod across the Red Sea and the Red Sea parting and they're crossing over on dry land becomes irrelevant. If there is no birth, death, and resurrection, Paul would have never spoken a mumbling word. If there is no birth and resurrection, the writer of Hebrews would have never understood the context of faith by saying, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Because without no birth, death, and resurrection, the divine three assurances of God would never have been materialized. Birth, death, and resurrection. Within the gospel, we have three assurances that will keep us grounded when we face swift transition. Anybody been faced with swift transition? Anybody woke up one morning and their beloved was with them, but by that evening they were dead? That's swift transition. Anybody ever went into work and you thought that you were going to work the next day and found out in 24 hours they're laying everybody off. That swift transition. Anybody ever woke up in the morning and had the love of their life and then felt betrayed? Anybody ever had a friend that you thought was stick closer to you than a brother, but now they are no longer with you? That's called swift transition. But when we're faced with such transition, these three assurances will keep you grounded when it seems difficult to stand. These assurances are simple. I want you to put them on your hearts today. He loves us. That's number one. He knows what you are going through. It is just part 
of the journey. And finally, we have power to rise out of our forsaken state. Those are the three assurances that we can glean from the birth, the death, and the resurrection. I don't know how many scriptures you know. I don't know how often you watch Bible class. I don't know how often you attend Sunday school. I encourage you to do all three. But if for some reason you should not, I want you to remember the assurances of God today. He loves you. He understands what you're going through. And you can rise out of your forsaken state. So if, you, if for some reason you can't find your way to Bible class, understand that God has three assurances that are waiting for you and waiting for me. These three assurances are found in several scriptures. They're not limited to these scriptures, but for purposes of today, we can't read the whole Bible. Here are three scriptures that I personally like that remind me when I'm going through of the assurances of God. When I'm reminded that he loves us, when I'm reminded that he loves us, I want you to go to the thesis statement of the Bible. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave. See, the fact that he gave, that's the birth. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's power in the birth of Jesus. Jesus was birthed out of God's love for humanity. God loved us so much that he gave his son to be born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem that required a Holy Ghost choir to acknowledge his entrance into the world. And if God gave his son, God wants you to know today that he loves you. God didn't give his son for Pastor Hunt alone. God didn't give his son for the deacons alone. God didn't give his son for the choir alone. But God gave his son to the world. And because of the birth of Christ, we know that God loves us in spite of ourselves. So there's somebody having a pity party today. You feel you're not worth being loved. You're saying, Pastor, if you only knew all the stuff that I've done, if you only knew, Pastor, where I've been as early as last night, God doesn't love me. I want you to know that he loves you and that he allowed his son to be born, not for the perfection of the world, but for the calamity of the world, that the world through him might be saved. God loves you so much that he wants you to come out today. Crackhead, come out. Alcoholic, come out. Pornography, come out. Hatred, come out. Speak to that demon today and say, come on out, because he loves me. You think you're not worth saving. He wants you to know that I love you so much that I gave part of myself. I gave the homoousios. I gave the same substance of my divinity to come into the world and be flesh. First thing you know when your life will make you think, swift transition makes you think he don't love you. Why he take my mama? Why he take my father? Why he take my friends? Why he take away my money? Why he take away my job? Why did he take away my health? I want you to know that despite all of that, he loves you. So you can be assured today that no matter what you're going through, he loves you. When folk don't love you, he loves you. When folk talk about you, he loves you. When those closest to you turn their back on you, he loves you. When you can't find no love in this world from a man or from a woman, he still loves you. Second thing, second thing, is that he understands what you're going through. I know we hear this all the time, he understands what we're going through. We'll go to Mark 15, 34. Mark 15, 34 lets us know in a direct way that he understands what we're going through. 
the text says at three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We see that our Lord is not riding on a steed. He's not sitting on a throne, but he's being crucified on a cross. We see him asking God the question that we ask God when we go through. I don't know about you, but every now and then I've asked God, are you really here? And as every now and then I ask God the Verizon question, can you hear me now? Because it looks like you can't hear me. It looks like you ain't paying attention. It seems like everything around me is falling apart. It seems like everything I trusted, I can't trust no more. And so God, it looks like you have forsaken me. But when we look at Mark 15, 34, we see that our Lord understands because he's been through that thing himself. So not only does he love you, he understands. He understands that all your friends done walked out on you. He understands that you're on the chopping block at work. He understands that you're in a lot of pain because there is no pain greater than being pierced in the side. There is no pain greater than having a crown of thorns on your head. There is no pain greater than being nailed to the cross. There is no pain greater than being so thirsty that the death process has started in your life. It is no pain greater than your heart beginning to stop at the pinnacle of Calvary's cross. So he understands because he's been through it. He knows what you're going through. And endured, watch this though, watch this. He endured forsakenness to heal you through your forsaken state. He endured forsakenness to heal you through your forsaken state. What are you talking about, Pastor? See, Christ is on the cross for the remedy. This is the remedy. And I'm not talking about the COVID shot, but let me go to the flu shot. You know how most vaccines work. And many of us were concerned with this with the COVID shot. In order for you to be healed, you got to take on a little bit of the, of the, of the flu. You got to take on a little bit of the virus. And so in, in order to heal us, Christ had to take on hatred. Christ had to take on pain. Christ had to take on disappointment. And he did all that. So you can walk through that thing. He did all that so you can be delivered through that thing. And if you deliver through that thing, it's because he knows. Yes, he knows just how much we can bear. So he understands. And in his forsaken state, he knows what it can do to you because verse 37, that's the death. After crying out, after crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He experiences the death. Verse 37 says, then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last breath. So there's the birth and through the death, we understand that he knows, oh yes, he knows, because he's been there. Not only did he go through for himself, but he went through so you and I might be able to be delivered from our forsaken states. That's birth. That's death. But there he is. Resurrection. And as we know on the third day, he rose with all power in his hands. And my friends, that is resurrection. But even the text suggests to us that simple resurrection would not have been good enough. A simple resurrection would not have given us the three, the assurance that we need that we can fight swift transition. Um, but not only did he resurrect. But resurrection ushers in the third assurance of God, which is power. Um, that's why the text says that he got up early on Sunday morning. Not just getting up. I know it ain't Easter, but if you can't have an Easter speech outside of Easter, then you must not know him. But he got up with all power in his hand. 
So come on, Acts 1, verse 8. Let's us know that after resurrection, power is important. And so no matter what you're going through today, I want you to know that he loves you, he understands, and you got power to get up out of that thing. And we hear in Acts 1, 8, the blessed assurance that you will receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you will be my witness in all Jerusalem, all Judea, and all Samaria. Then you will have power. Power to rise up. Power. Somebody said to make you live right. Power to keep you from losing your very mind. And so the birth, the death, and resurrection of Christ is good news. Oh, is it good news? It's good news because not only did Jesus go through things, but God divinely inspired the step that he would take so that we would get assurance that everything was going to be all right. So he was born for us to know that God loves us. He was crucified on Calvary's tree for us to know that God understands what we're going through. And he rose, oh yes, he rose, not only to say that he was the king of kings and lord of lords, but he rose that we might have power to live a better life. We might have power to access life and have it more abundantly. Well, I'm almost through. When we consider the three assurances of the gospel, we are assured the blessed promise that no matter what may come down here, that some glad morning when this life is over, you and I shall fly away. I don't know what's going to happen down here, but we got the blessed assurance that one day it'll be his to call and God's to answer. We have the assurance because he loves us and he understands us. And because he did it to us, the power of eternal life that we're promised to live in a building not made by hand. But I want you to know, sometime it ain't good enough for me to hear about the hereafter. I want to hear the power of the gospel for right here and right now. We are further assured in the here and in the now by the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are further assured that until he calls us home, that when the storms of life are raging and when the billows roar, we can be assured that he loves us in spite of ourselves he knows oh yes he knows just how much we can bear when the thunder the thunder roars and when the lightning flashes we have power over swift transition we have power over fierce transition we have power to make it through our circumstance i heard a preacher say isn't that good news? Isn't it good news? Well, if you're tuning in today and you want to hear a prosperity message, you turn to the wrong church and you turn to the wrong channel. I would love to promise you all the money in the world. I would love to promise you the best mate in the world. I would love to promise you the finest car on the street. I would love to promise you the biggest job that money can buy. I would love to tell you you're not going to have any problems. I would love to tell you that you're never going to be sick. I would love to tell you you're never going to have any financial challenges. I would love to tell my babies that they ain't never going to be heartbroken. 
But these assurances, I can never promise from the halls of this sacred place. But I want you to know with Jesus' joy that the death, the birth, the death, and the resurrection assures me no matter what you're going through, no matter how you got to cry all night long, no matter what your life station may be, somebody say, he'll fix it, he'll fix it, he'll fix it. I know he can, and I know that he will. He'll fix it. I don't know much, but I know that he can. I know that he will. And he all right, and he all right, and he all right. Somehow the time he'll fix it. He promised never to leave me. He promised never to forsake me. He promised to turn my midnight in the day. He promised to turn my darkness into the marvelous light. He promised, oh, he promised never to leave me, to leave me alone. So if you want to give up today, if you want to throw in the towel today, I want you to put in the spirit of the gospel. And when you put in the spirit of the gospel, just when I've wanted to give up, I've sang and shouted the words of the songwriter. Trouble in my way, I have to cry sometimes. Trouble in my way, I gotta moan sometimes. Trouble in my way, I have to cry sometimes. I lay awake at night, but that's all right. I lay awake tossing and turning all night, wondering when the church is gonna open, but that's all right. I lay awake friendless, but that's all right. I lay awake, somebody laying awake can't pay your bills, but that's all right. I lay awake at night, but that's all right, because Jesus, Jesus will fix it after a while. He'll fix it after all. We pray you enjoy this evening's Friday night word. I know that you have been blessed, and I know that you are stronger now than what you were before you tuned in. We thank you for being a part of this ministry. And if you want to give to this ministry and support to this ministry, we invite you to give to Givelify. PayPal, or Cash App. And you can also give if you do not have the monetary means. You can give to this ministry by sharing the good news and sharing this message with your family and friends and telling everyone about Friday Night Word and about Liberty Baptist Church of Chicago. We pray that God's peace will be with you until we meet again.